Top Med Talk. Nick McCherryson here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. This piece is taken from the Perioptive Medicine Shared Interest Group's 2018 annual conference, Measuring, Managing and Minimising Risk, which was held in association with the Australian and New Zealand Society of Geriatric Medicine and the Internal Medicine Society of Australia and New Zealand. Don't forget to check out the show notes on topmedtalk.com for more details. Have a listen. So it's now time for questions. Um, I might point out there are two roving microphones uh, down the back there. So you can still submit your questions online and I will present them, or you can just put your hand up and we'll come to you. The the one question that really stood out, I might start off with this. Um, Having a vast range in frailty tools makes comparing patient groups almost impossible. There is a need for consensus. How are we going to achieve this? So I guess the question is, we all know that frailty, I think we've come to that agreement, should be tested for and discussed in pre-admission clinics. But what does the committee feel here might be the best tool to go forward? David was suggesting that the CFS is getting their guernsey, but what, what do you think? Well, the clinical frailty is this on the clinical frailty scale. Um, you know, has a lot of strengths, but it was originally intended to be a screening test, and a lot of people are sort of clumping around the the five six um, level on that. And um, you know, I personally uh, think that the frailty index has a lot of strengths too, because it's it's more granular, it's more precise. Um, but it's always been criticized for being too time-consuming. So if we could generate a frailty index from routinely collected information, which is surely not beyond our ability in terms of our um, technical expertise and the amount of data that is collected for patients when they come into hospital now, um, that's potentially um, the way forward. But people do feel very strongly uh, about in, about different frailty tools. It's going to be different, difficult to, to, to reach consensus Um, But, you know, I've been developing um, a frailty index that can be derived from a nurse-administered assessment instrument. So nurses are really key to um, that first-line assessment of patients, and uh, they need to collect a lot of of this data, and we can simply code it as deficits and, and press a button and a frailty index comes out. So I'm quite excited about the opportunities that will provide. Um, I might ask Bobby Jean, I've noticed that the frail scale came up in one of your slides and there seems to be a push. A lot of the literature coming out of the US seems to be using the Linda Freed phenotype model as, as the basis of the research. Do you want to comment on how that's going for you in the US compared to, say, risk suggestion maybe for the frailty index as an alternative? You know, I think the Linda Freed index was developed and her work was in non-surgical patients, obviously, and it was administered typically by, you know, skilled geriatricians, and it takes quite a bit of time. So I think everyone's been trying to extract out the key points from that, um, that perhaps can still maintain relatively good sensitivity and specificity but also looking at it from the perspective of the surgical patient and how that, you know, is probably differs. And I think generally people are really focusing in on that functional piece, you know, just activities of daily living and, you know, how the anaerobic, aerobic capacity of patients Um, because that the other data from surgical studies suggest that that is such a strong predictor um, and then I think the important part, too, is adding in that cognitive piece, which is, you know, technically not part of the frailty, um, but they often go hand in hand. The frail patient also is, is cognitively at risk and have cognitive impairment because that also factors in so much, not just only predicting the post-op delirium, but also predicting how well patients will be able to help take care of themselves or engage in that post-operative piece and care that is so important. Um, so I think there's a lot of initiatives you know, going around right now trying to figure out what is the best tool. I think it has to be pretty straightforward, um, fairly easy to apply. Um, I think you know, having nurses and like in our situation, our medical assistants be able to do it and not requiring a, a skilled physician to, to administer it. Um, sometimes you know, we look for, sometimes better is the enemy of good enough. You know, we should maybe start with something and something that we can use as opposed to trying to figure out what is the ideal um, tool and then start gathering data. David? Um, 
I guess being bookended by geriatricians, I've got questions for you guys. The, the thing that I said is the CFS clinical frailty scale is a screening tool. The question is, once you've screened, what do you do then? Given that the gold standard is comprehensive geriatric assessment by a specialist geriatrician. So there is, do we just screen and then make a plan? Because when you consider the amount of time and effort that goes into the other components of a patient's operation, hmm. I was very mindful of this. I have been involved with the Medicare review on the Urology Clinical Committee. There was a lot of talk about multidisciplinary teams and risk and radiotherapy versus surgery for prostatectomy. But there was no discussion about all the other factors with the patient. It was all about their prostate cancer. And there was no element of this. So <clears throat> what I wonder is, the argument, as I see it, is we're putting a lot of effort into your disease, but not into the rest of you. And should we, in fact, be looking more at a model which is to screen, and then if they screen into the frail group, they then are considered further by specialists in, in geriatric medicine? Ruth, do you want to comment? Yeah, I think, I think that's... That's the model that we're trying to, to set up because, you know, many patients... Surgery, you know, we've spoken about this many times, David, that surgery was sort of set up based on the procedure originally and, and it was thought that everyone would have this smooth throughput. Uh, and, and some patients who are, who are younger and fitter can, can be accommodated in that pathway, but others need a different approach. And comprehensive direct assessment, I was talking about this before we came in, isn't just assessment. It's, mm. it's assessment and management. And the management um, involves liaison with the multidisciplinary team, you know, optimization of polypharmacy. There's, and there's good evidence that CGA can improve outcomes for, for frailer older people. Um, so, so that's what we should be aiming for. So I think Jeremy actually asked a question which kind of extends on this. So we've looked at the lots of, um, you presented some of the bundles as a response to prehabilit uh, prehabilitation as an agenda and uh, frailty if it's picked up on, on the scale. So are we getting ahead of ourselves? Are we studying the effectiveness of the bundles before we actually know the effectiveness of the individual components in the bundle? And I guess the, second, the corollary to that is which of these interventions that we've talked about this morning really have the biggest return? Which one should we be concentrating on? So, for example, nutrition versus exercise versus... Yeah, I... I wouldn't be in favour of dissecting it out. It's a complex intervention in response to a complex problem. And, um, you know, it's, for example, people have tried to think about stroke, management of stroke, and, and trying to tease out which component of, of uh, stroke management is effective. And they can't really do that. Because you can't take away the, the, the stroke consultant from the uh, environment, from the multidisciplinary team. It all has to be done. Um, and... Uh, you know, the, some geriatricians I speak to are very opposed to, to frailty as a label for people and worry that it's going to um, prevent them from having certain interventions. And, um, and they, they also worry that it, it's not telling you where the, the frailty index, for example, if you have a high frailty index, it doesn't tell you where the deficits are. But the frail, a high frailty index should just be the start of the, of the thought processes about a patient. And then you see if a frailty index is triggered as being high, then the geriatrician will start thinking about where those deficits are. Um, so I don't see a problem in having a, a simple tool at the outset that can then be used for more complex um, decision making. I mean, from a clinical trials point of view, I think the important thing to remember is that when you do a clinical trial, you've got equipoise. I mean, yes, when you go into any trial, you think, look, this is the likely outcome. Um, and the, the more important thing about the bundle is if it doesn't work. So you put the whole lot together, the best, all the best possible things put together, and if you show it doesn't work, then you move on, and so actually this is not effective. And so it, it, it's the, I agree in total with what Ruth's saying. But the counter is by putting them all together, you say, well, look, it doesn't work as a bundle, it won't work as individual bits, so don't even think about it. Let's go in another direction. OK. Um, this is a question about how to engage the patient. So education may not be enough to motivate. Is there any further evidence on using additional interventions, it, such as motivational interview techniques, to improve engagement when you've told the patient that they are frail? So I'm not aware of any large studies or trials or publications showing that there are tools that you can use um, to do that, um, to motivate patients or to get them engaged. I think there's, extrapolating from sort of just shared decision making, I think by, there's tools that you can use to get the patient engaged better about their conversations, about understanding their risk, helping them make decisions. 
Um, and so we have that interest in seeing whether we can develop similar sort of, of ways to identify those patients who aren't engaged and then to use certain tools to actually get them better engaged. I think a lot of it is that often frail and elderly patients particularly are, do suffer from depression. Um, and obviously they also suffer from some cognitive impairments. So how much we can intervene um, will depend, I guess, on how reversible some of those things are. But I think, you know, uh, if we can treat their depression, for example, then improve their engagement that way, it makes sense that it would be effective. But are you aware of any perioperative attempts already at doing that? No, I'm not, actually. So this is a question about prehabilitation. Are there any studies evaluating cost effectiveness in prehabilitation? It's difficult to persuade our executives to fund the extra resources for the ideal model that is effective. Um, I'll answer that one. As far as I know, no, in part because um, the, the culture of really looking at cost effectiveness for interventions in clinical trials has only just really emerged in perioperative research, I think, in, and in clinical trials generally. Uh, and I think as we move towards large and stronger clinical trials, there will be integrated, particularly bundles of care trials, there will be integrated uh, health economics to try and answer exactly those questions so we can deal with uh, administrative overlords. Okay. There's a question at the back there. Yeah, hello. Peter Seal from Melbourne, anaesthetist intensive care specialist. Thanks to all the speakers. Great talks. Um, Dave Storey, got a question for you, and it's simple. Forget the six-minute test. What about the get out, get up out of a chair and walk five metre test? Um, my 92-year-old mother on your Rockwood scale would be moderately to severe, so between a six and a seven. So she doesn't do too well on that five-metre test. So I, I guess I'd, I'd rather ask Ruth. I, I'm aware that there are other uh, straightforward tests. I mean, you know, it's a, if you like a physical version of asking about activities of daily living. Um, Ruth, what are your thoughts about things like the up and go test? Yeah, the time get up and go is a great little test. You know, it incorporates um, balance, um, mobility, um, and, and it's it's integrated into some some frailty tools. The Edmonton Frailty Scale uses it a lot, um, and it does it is does give you a reflection of of some uh, 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 of, of somebody's frailty status. I think it's a good test. But again, it's probably more a screening... T it's not a diagnostic tool, it's a screening tool. So the question is, if they fail the, the up and go, what do you do next? Mm. And my answer would be that's when you then go and consult our geriatrician experts. So this is a, a question from a surgeon, so I might try to get it in there. OK, I'm convinced about prehabilitation, but how do we get the clinic running and paid for? It comes back to the question earlier. You've got to convince uh, the dark side that it's cost effective. <laughs> so how um, do you engage the dark side, David? <clears throat> the, I, look, I mean, I think one of the really important things in this is also, um, you know, that, that we have particularly... We're lucky in Australia and New Zealand is we can look more broadly. Unfortunately, sometimes hospitals really drill down and micromanage the finances. But to my mind, part of it is convincing government through appropriate evidence that, you know, in terms of patient journey, public health, value and, you know, to a certain degree the workforce, that we're doing the right things for patients by doing these things. I think that is the key. If we can convince, you know, those, the, the various departments of health and, you know, the, the government that this is the way to go, that's the way to win, because they will then say to the hospital administrators, we expect you to be doing this. So ultimately you would want to see the Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare saying, are you, are you implementing the, pre the prehabilitation bundle? And they get a big tick if they are, and they get a big cross if they're not, and all the administrators are upset. So I, another thing to do is realize that, you know, you can take baby steps and there's even home-based uh, programs where patients can even have apps on their phone and, you know, they have to walk a certain amount every day. They have to report in that they do a certain amount of things. And then, you know, focusing on those other things other than aerobic prehabilitation, which is, you know, the smoking cessation, the anemia management, the comorbid optimization, getting the dietitian involved. Um, you know, so I think those are you know individual components that you can do that doesn't require necessarily a sort of 
you know, focused program. But I think another place to start is, is engage your physical therapy departments because mm-hmm. physical therapists are the ones who are doing the rehab and you can get those people involved in doing similar kind of things just before the surgery. Um, and your geriatricians, which you know, often are also uh, much more keen and, in, and engaged in these kinds of interventions with patients ahead of time. Got a question on the floor? Yeah, thanks. Um, two kind of kind of comments, kind of questions. One, one to that second one. Like, I think it's interesting that we're talking about implementing something that you've really shown a trial with fifty-two people in it to, as preliminary evidence, and, and and ongoing trials that will have cost effectiveness. We shouldn't be implementing those things because they're an opportunity cost for things that we know already work. We know ERAS principles work and haven't been adequately implemented. We know delirium prevention programs work and haven't been adequately implemented. So let's do the things that there is really good evidence for first while we do the trials for the other ones. The second comment would be um, just about the data, Bobby Jean, that you showed about um, the, the really interesting study about frailty screening reducing mortality published in JAMA. And I'd just like to introduce a caveat about that because they didn't measure mortality. They measured post-operative mortality. They reduced operations very substantially. So there was different decision making. And the mortality in the patients who didn't have an operation, who were frailer, was not measured. So yes, the surgeons felt better that less of their patients died. But, but it's different to, the, to less population mortality. So I think we just have to be cautious that it doesn't necessarily mean there was less, mor- less mortality. Can I, um, but, but I think sorry. that's important because, again, perhaps it, it, they helped him identify patients who are the futility of operations. Perhaps, um, perhaps. Hmm. But because they didn't measure the, whether there was more suffering or more cost... Um, or less suffering or less... Co- so I think we just have to be really cautious about... Uh, so then it might have been... I, I think futility is really important to discuss and maybe they were the right decisions, but without knowing what the outcomes were for that other group in terms not just of mortality but in terms of suffering and cost. So sometimes not having an operation entails more suffering and cost than having an operation. That's absolutely true. You know, every time you make a decision to not do something, that's an active decision to take another path, and even if there's, you know, nothing is done. But I think that, um, you know, we know from other situations that over the last 50 years, we've, the, you know, numbers of surgeries that are done has markedly just exploded. Um, and that many surgeries um, have shown to have no utility for patients, even those who aren't frail and you know, I jokingly say, I don't know how many orthopedists are in the audience, but I, I often say that if an orthopedist can do something through a scope, it's not going to help you. <laughs> you know, it's, um, so, I mean, I do think that we've just gotten to, you know, in this very escalated kind of, you know, uh, situation where surgery is the answer to everything. Um, and I think we know it's not, and particularly in those patients who are at the highest risk. So I agree that, that, you know, the details are in that study. I don't have time to go into the details of whether just frailty screening, um, you know, help those ones who are just having... But if, if it identifies patients who shouldn't have surgery, um, you know, if you're going to be 30% chance of dying a year after you have a lumpectomy, should you have had a lumpectomy, even if it didn't contribute to your death, you, it didn't, you know, imp- likely improve that one year of your life that was left. Can, can I say something? Um, controversy alert. Um, uh, what is the randomised trial demonstrates the benefit of ERAS? So, so I, did I just not hear? Yes, we know it definitely works. So, so there are a number of RCTs which trial and which trial there are, me- but there's meta-analysis evidence for. ERAS. Yeah, I know, but which randomised so, trial? There are no large randomised trials of ERAS. True, but there's many. I am, in fact, a co-author from the New England Journal of a paper that I'll present on Saturday which suggests that one of the tenets of ERAS, which is fluid restriction, does not improve outcome and worsens outcome. Yep, yep. So, so my, my, sorry, to, I, I just want to pump this. And I, I, so I'm going to be controversial. <laughs> ERAS probably has benefit... ERAS, the benefit may be just cultural shift. I know there's a big push about, you know, you've got to do all the, the elements. 
I would argue that it may be that the number of elements you put in shows how good your hospital is at thinking about individual patients. I am very concerned when people say that there is great evidence for errors. There is not. There are large, you know, non-randomised trials. And then we've, when we've gone and done a, a large randomised trial of a major component of ERAS, it was counter to the hypothesis. And we have time and time again in perioperative medicine seen things counter the hypothesis. And the, the most important one I can think of immediately is tight glucose control in intensive care. Tight glucose control was killing people. And I'm very concerned, and I, I don't want to sound like a dogmatic pain in the ass, but I know I'm being one. <coughs> yeah, yeah, but I will anyway. We need to be, and as perioperative medicine evolves, I, I entirely agree with you that we have this issue that we think things work and they seem intuitively obvious. But I think it is really important that, that particularly where we have the strengths of research in Australia and New Zealand, we pursue these questions, we answer them, and we also implement the findings of those studies. So, so I, I agree. Did, yeah. I, I think we're actually on the same page. We are, I, but I just the ERAS thing yeah, sets yeah, me off yeah. a bit. And, I, and I'm not, and I'm not <laughs> Alison, talking about individual components. I, yeah. I think as a bundle in meta-analysis, it works. The, that is stronger yeah. evidence than prehab, but we want to jump at prehab. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. So we're going to go into prehabilitation. Two questions. What is the minimum time that the panel thinks is needed for successful prehabilitation? Most of the studies seem to be at two weeks. Is that enough time? Do we need to be spending more time at it? Well, I think one issue is if we go back to one thing that, that probably does have, you know, Bobby Jean was talking about it, is, is um, iron treatment. Iron treatment is probably uh, optimally given intravenous iron therapy, so particularly for patients undergoing colorectal cancer surgery, is probably about two weeks preoperatively. Um, so there are elements, you know, if we looked about the strongest element, I think that is probably one that would help time what you're doing. Uh, Bernard will tell you that the insightful surgeons at Peter Mac are happy to delay surgery to try and improve the overall patient well-being. And I, I agree, and Bernard would be the first to say, there isn't strong randomised evidence, but that is the practice given, on the, given their experience at the moment. OK, a couple of other questions. Uh, what does the panel think of weight loss as part of prehabilitation? There's a lot of talk about nutrition in malnourished patients, but obese patients have malnutrition of their own. How, how major of a problem is obesity and, and weight loss programs? How necessary are them? Are they in this setting? Well, obesity is a huge problem for, for older people in terms of their fu causing functional limitations, but it, the studies haven't been done about um, you know, weight loss because, that, of course, that takes a longer period than, uh, than trying to build somebody up a bit. Absolutely. Uh, are there any studies showing the importance of sleep in I mean, patients? Sorry, is it, are there many people who are both frail and obese? Yeah. Or, yes. Yeah. And malnourished and obese. Okay. Yeah, and sarcopenic and obese. Yeah. Um, one of the questions, actually, now that you've raised sarcopenia, is um, there's not been much discussion about sarcopenia and its role in the perioperative setting. Do we need to discuss it more openly? What's its relevance in terms of frailty? Would you like to comment, Ruth, maybe? They're very closely linked to frailty in sarcopenia, the loss of muscle mass and function and, and, and strength. Um, uh, some people sort of conceptualise it as a completely separate process to frailty, but I think it's all very closely linked together in terms of ageing and degeneration and decline, but and something that we might be able to do something about, if not reverse completely. There's also another screening test that's used in um, aortic and, uh, and colorectal cancer surgery where with the abdominal CT that's part of the surgery, you can look at the area across the psoas muscles as, a, as an attempt to, to quantify sarcopenia. Um, two last questions. Are there any studies showing the importance of sleep in patients and, their effect, and its effect on preparation for surgery? Sleep. 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 So getting your sleep before surgery. Uh, actually, that's an interesting question. Sleep mm. disturbance in the frail and elderly? Mm, well, it's, it, there are a few reports starting to come out about how important it is. And, um, you know, long periods of changes in circadian rhythm are thought to have an impact on, on health status and frailty status in older age. But um, I don't know about the immediate effect and whether it can be um, reversed. Very imp important in relation to delirium, obviously. Mm. And the final point, um, this is, I don't know if it's a statement or a question, but I'll try to turn it into a question. Often I feel futile doing these assessments. And when I told my surgeon there's an 80% risk of complications and 50% mortality in a 92-year-old, they still go ahead. The attitude being it's worth taking the risk and I can't let the patient die. 
So I guess the question in that is how do we engage our surgical colleagues if we do feel that the situation is untenable? Do you have any advice on how we should be doing this? Well, it's, it's going to require a, a paradigm shift, isn't it? And the important thing is what the patient wants. Um, and we just have to reframe the discussion around, uh, around their, their own goals of care and, uh, rather than surgery can be done. I, I think to a certain degree, um, to paraphrase, you can gang up on them a little bit. Uh, you know, we, we have colleagues. So if you, in that situation, if you bring in colleagues in geriatric medicine, if you bring colleagues in intensive care medicine into the discussion and say, well, where do we think this patient's going to go? What are the goals? I think particularly if you have a goals of care, if you say to the surgeon, what do you actually want to get out of this? And say to the patient, what do they want to get out? What are the, and what do the family think? I think that helps move beyond the, I must, you know, there's an operation, I must do it. Um, and once you force the surgeon to say, where do you think this is going to go? I think that pushes the issue a bit more. And I think you can do that without being too confrontational. Yeah. Probably do. Sorry, my original couple of slides about the generation shift. So the, this, the patients who are 90 now are the, the silent generation who would happily go along with what the surgeon told them. But I think that is going to change in, in, the, in the years to come. You know, I also want to add that piece, and I want to really focus on my talk about the, the you know, after 30-day mortality or the after one year, I mean, one um, week mortality at 30 days. You know, I... I think many surgeons that I talked to were shocked by that JAMA surgical article that showed that 30% of patients were dead one year after their lumpectomy. Surgeons don't have follow-up long-term. We have no data in the United States, I don't know what's here, about how well patients do or don't do. You know, don't do. And so I think that, again, by identifying this group of patients who are elderly, who are frail, who have limited life expectancy, regardless of whether they have surgery or not, then when surgeons start to become aware of that, I think they are having their own aha moments. Um, it's like, yeah, like, yeah, why would we put the patient through this? Why do we have the patient just, even the time they're coming to the hospital and having CT scans and, and follow-up and not being with their family and not enjoying you know, what little life they have left. And I think that's so important. It's just this idea that you're gonna live forever and all these stories about, you know, people are 100 having joint replacements and still running marathons. But we forget that that's the 0.1% of, of that age group. So, oh, one last question from the floor. Or just as one of the few surgeons in the audience, it's Michael Cox. Mm -hmm. The way of doing it is actually to get all of your surgeons to use the Nesquik calculator routinely in their room and tick it off to say that they've actually shown them the graphics and talked to their patients about it. That's when they'll realise what their longer term outcomes and the risks really are. And that's when they'll engage the patients. Yeah, I agree with that. The Nesquip printout is fantastic uh, discussion starter. I agree. So on that note, we might stop. I'd like you to join me in thanking our speakers for an excellent presentation. Nick Jerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.